Welcome back, everyone. It's been a long, but also short, but also time doesn't mean anything anymore, two weeks off. We are glad to be back with another series, and this time we have guest David Gordon Brush with us talking through L5R Fizz Edition, mm. which has been a long time coming, and everyone will finally know what I'm talking about when I talk about <laughs> this game so much. I'm very excited for this one. Yeah. Uh, but first, some announcements. It's like your Palladium, but good. It's like my Palladium, but my game is good. <laughs> <laughs> well, better. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair. Fair. <laughs> All right. Well, voting for the 2020 Any Awards is open now through July 12th. Uh, there's great. There's tons of great stuff on the list, including Asians Represent. Uh, their podcast is up for an any. Uh, Visigoths versus Malgoths, which we've covered previously on the show. Uh, Witch Plus Craft, uh, which we've covered in a Spotlight episode, uh, Strata, and also Amelia is up for a 2021 judge. Uh, so, go, yeah, go ahead and uh, vote. We're going to put the voting link in our show notes for you, uh, but it'd be really awesome if we could show some support for these uh, these amazing people. Absolutely. A thing that we didn't put in our cold open notes, but I'm going to announce right now, too, that we should put a link to our sh to in our show notes um, is that the Asian Re Asians Represent podcast also recently did a Twitch stream where they started looking through the fifth edition of L5R. Mm -hmm. um, I watched the first episode of that. I think that they're going to do more because they didn't get very yep. far <laughs> in the book in their two hour chat because mm -hmm. it's a long book. Um, but we should put a link to the uh, YouTube for that in our show notes too, mm -hmm. if people want to follow along with their reading of it. Yeah. Um, it was very good. I think their their first series was going through the Oriental Adventures uh, from D&D. Yes. Um, and that was, what, 12 two-hour episodes or something like yeah. that? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I imagine it's going to be probably pretty similar for L5R. So I, I was really interested to see what they had to say about um, L5R and um, looking forward to more of that. Yeah, definitely. I want to see what, what they find out that's you know, different from us covering it. Mm-hmm. Um, but another great thing that you can do, aside from voting for the Ennies, uh, is leaving us reviews like this mm -hmm. one from Ison86 from the United States of America on iTunes. Also, super sorry if I mispronounced that. It's titled Required Listening. This podcast offers invaluable insight in all kinds of tabletop games. DMs and players alike can learn all kinds of things and gain new ideas from these amazing hosts and guests. Thank, well, thank you. you so much. Yeah, that was nice. It was very nice. I love reviews. <laughs> I know. They're so nice. They made me so happy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all right. Well, with all of that out of the way, let's get on with the show. Enjoy. Welcome to Character Creation Cast, a show where we discuss and create characters, the best part of role-playing games, with guests using their and Amelia's favorite systems. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan, and this episode, my co-host Amelia and I are thrilled to welcome David Gordon Brush to discuss Legend of the Five Rings, a samurai role-playing game by Fantasy Flight Games. David, welcome to Character Creation Cast. We're very excited you could join us. I'm very excited to be here. I've actually really been a fan of the show for quite some time, so I'm really glad to finally be able to get on here and talk with you. Awesome. Let's start by introducing you to our audience. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about yourself, any projects you're currently involved in, things you're passionate about? So, um, for those who aren't aware, I am David Gordon Buresh. I am a writer, game designer, game design consultant, um, and, well, right now, political activist, because, hey, that's the world. And, we all ought to be at this point. <laughs> um, I write the Dave of the Five Rings blog, which is a monthly Legend of the Five Rings blog, still, you know... One of the few oldies, as it were, keeping things in print media still alive. <laughs> um, and other than that, I've um, a 
published author. I write short, short horror fiction. Um, I'm an occasional games journalism and various other things, which in my ever decreasing spare time. <laughs> As for what I'm passionate about, um, Legend of the Five Rings, social justice, indigenous rights, all that stuff. Awesome. Well, let's go ahead and get into this and start by discussing what this game is all about. What's in a game? All right. Uh, can you tell us a bit about the setting of Legend of the Five Rings? Ooh, could I? <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy, can I? <laughs> um, I've, so Legend of the Five Rings is a game where we play magical samurai in the fantasy land of Rokugan, where various great clans vie for dominance to please the haunty emperor and it is a place where honor is a force stronger than steel. And I literally think that that's been burned into my memory from when I first <laughs> read it in the uh, 19, late 1990s. And skip over that just as there we go. Ah. 19, 1996, <laughs> when yep. it all started. <laughs> I got into it in 1997. So um, this game has been a part of my life for 23 years. And really, it, I mean, that's basically the pitch um it's a fantasy game um set in uh basically oriental adventures by way of way too much japan um with uh color corded magical samurai battling for uh battling for glory and dominance uh i think it's important to point out that it was originally a card game mm -hmm. um with a very deep interactive story and has been built upon for 25 years almost now. And uh, yeah, that's Legend of the Five Rings. Yeah, there's there's so much there. Um, <laughs> I, oof, huh. Yeah. That's for, that's for another time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what sort of things do we need to play this game? Well, fortunately, to play this game, um, all you really need is the core rules book or the beginner set um, and the Fantasy Flight Games dice, uh, which are a set of 5D6s that have a custom series of icons on it and 5D12s that have a likewise custom series of icons on it. Um, you can just play with five regular D sixes and five regular D twelves. You just need a chart there to sort of tell you, um, what each number corresponds to what face. Hmm. And other than that, imagination, three to four friends and a lot of spare time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For it's sure. a rabbit hole that you'll fall into and there's no way out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Someone will say, let's play this game. And you say, that sounds really dumb. And then Five ten years, years later, later, ten years later, let's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this is where you are, <laughs> right? <laughs> well, what kind of stories and themes is this game meant to explore? So, again, um, this is very much a Japanese slash Pan Asian themed fantasy story. So, we are looking to explore intrigue, courtly drama adventure um but really in many ways sort of this high stakes high emotion dramatic conflict of important empowered people each one trying to uphold this code of behavior that really wasn't meant to be upheld by people hmm. and and it's basically, again, it's the high stakes, literally the, the entire fate of millions of lives balance upon the edge of a sword. And whoever can truly ex excel in the ways of Bushido the most stands to reap all of the benefits in the world. So very high drama. I love that this game has the ability to tell, like, kind of tragic stories, too, in a way that something like D&D &D doesn't. Not that you can't, but, like, you know, like, D&D, &D, you, are, you are the hero. Um, and ideally, in this game, you kind of are. Um, but there's some of that internal conflict that, like, maybe you aren't always. Um, and that, like, it can tell these kind of tragic, sad stories, too. 
like a good, like any good story, every every side has its own version of it. Um, one of the most important things is you call out sort of the tragic nature of it is that like one of the questions they ask you, as we'll get into in the character creation process, is literally, how will your character die? Mm-hmm. And there's the old adage that um, to be a samurai is to never live more than four feet from death. Um, and in many ways, this is sort of this informs the narrative as this. It really is meant to be this game where you not only can you die, you will die. Make sure you die doing something right. Mm-hmm. That's heavy. <laughs> it's so cool. Like it, it explores a space that a lot of other games don't really get into because it's it's like this deep personal. I think there's a lot of interpersonal conflict too, mm. um, which I know some people like Ryan don't always love. <laughs> um, but it, both internally in you as a singular person, and then within a group too, because there's we'll get into it. Like your the the clash between your duty and your desires mm. and trying to balance those things. And it, it lends itself to telling some really cool stories that I don't feel like you get to tell in a lot of other games. Yes. Very much so. What do we as characters do in this game? Uh, what are we up to? It, it really can depend on the type of game. Um, the default is you are a samurai, which means you are a noble you have been born to wealth and privilege and power, uh, and you are expected to maintain society's structures, codes, and to live a life in service to your liege. Whether, how that manifests, again, depends on the character, depends on the story. You can be a group of what are called emerald magistrates who are sort of the inter-clan investigators who have to deal with also not just not just you know crimes but also supernatural weird stuff that nobody else mm-hmm. can um you could be this could be a story where you're part of the imperial legions so your characters are literally imperial peacekeepers being sent out to basically stop wars from starting because of course everyone always kind of wants to go to war here because it's part of the part of the problematic nature of the setting, but it is one of the elements to it. Mm -hmm. Um, You could all be courtiers and thus be dealing with sort of the economic side of Rokugan and trying to see who can have uh, the true importance of who can have the most compelling speech to get the right favors, to get to the right people, because that determines at the end of the day who eats. And when you're living in a fantasy agrarian society, that's power. Armies are nice, but you can't have an army if you can't feed an army. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's very true. Awesome. So what is unique about Legend of the Five Rings? I would say the most unique aspect of Legend of the Five Rings, um, the t- there's two of them. I'll, and then one, one very mechanical and one very setting. Okay. Um, the mechanical aspect is the, the, the roll and keep system that it uses, which Mm -hmm. is you sort of, you you, will go into it more later, but you build your dice pool, you roll your dice, you choose which of these dice that you are keeping. There's only so many of these dice you can keep, but you all, you have to keep one and some of these results might come at a cost. So it's very much that, that mechanical aspect of always asking yourself, how much do I want this? Hmm. How important is this to me? Is it more important for me to get this done now, even though it's going to cost me possibly later? That could be a disastrous cost down the line. Or is it better to be reserved and hold back? Um, Mm -hmm. For a setting-wise, it really does have to be the Great Clans. Um, The Great Clans are the seven sort of kingdoms within the empire of, of Rokugan. And they are each of each unto themselves a nation, as it were. They have their own traditions. They have their own great families who run things. They have their own beliefs. They have a lot of, and and again, like their own very complex, very deep history. But the identity of the clans are so iconic that 
they are what hook people in this game. And this is whether it's the role-playing game or whether it's the card game. In the card game, you're literally playing the factions. So, like, your deck is this faction's deck Mm -hmm. um, and stuff like that. And, like, they've been role-playing games. There have been been miniatures games. There was a POG game of this called Disc Wars. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that one. (laughs) Every single time, it's the great clans that that really hook you and keep you coming back to this because it builds it, it, this game is built to develop community around and that's why people love it and that's why it's survived 25 years hmm. and people are very passionate about their clan of choice <laughs> they're like <laughs> oh they will fight you <laughs> l5r fans are like sports fans yeah, <laughs> they have their yeah. team, and they love their team. And if you are the rival team, oh, do they got mm-hmm. words for you? <laughs> the next question that we always go into with our games is: we ask our guests to tell us a little bit about the history of the game. Um, this game has twenty five years of history, which uh, lots of games that we've covered have been around for a long time. Um, but L five R has a particularly like complex history mm-hmm. so i don't i don't know where you want to start with that I, um, again, I don't know where to start the easiest way to start is just to give how it came about uh which was legend of the five rings was a collectible card game in 1996 uh the original it was basically a collaboration if i'm remembering correctly and i apologize to all of you if i'm not um john wick and john zinzer are the two really big people who get credited for it ed balmy or Ed Bulm, I've never been able to say his last name correct, um, are sort of the three really big original people who helped form this game. And it was originally meant to be a two-year-long collectible card game, which told a very compact, very straightforward story where it was the battle at Biden Pass has begun the clan war as the crab clan has turned on the emperor who lies sick and dying in his throne room while the grand Ronin Toturi defends with the armies of the dragon and it builds to this grand sweeping narrative. Um, just sort of around 1998, if I'm remembering this correctly, they released the RPG, the first edition rules, which was actually set before the start of the game. Hmm about like solidly like two years before the battle of Biden pass and basically took you and said, all right, this is the empire before it kind of went crazy and things went into total war. Let's tell a story about this. Um, Since then, there were four editions of this RPG um, that were released under Alderac entertainment group. I was originally part of five rings publishing group, which was part of Alderac entertainment group. Went to Wizards of the Coast, then came back, um, during which, again, and the card game kept going and kept being played, and the story kept evolving, and every so often they would release a new edition of the car- of the rules, which would sort of update the storyline, or mm-hmm. your starting point in the storyline, and would incorporate certain developments and all sorts of things. Um, then in 2017? No, 2015. Man, I yeah, I think it's 2015. the game it was, was released in yeah 2017 is when the yeah. uh, the like when the new game like actually finally came out. So in 2015, um, one month after they had their 20th anniversary celebration, um, Eldrack Entertainment Group announced that they sold the game Lock, Stock, and Barrel to Fantasy Flight Games, um, stopped all production, ended under the storyline, ended the game, um, then. 2017 rolls around fantasy flight games releases the legend of the five rings lcg Mm -hmm. which set the storyline back before the original start of the original clan war (laughs) um and has been going for the last three years as this is our version of the clan war bigger louder better and Mm -hmm. i do mean actually better yeah it's yeah um certainly less confusing less confusing (laughs) um better representation for this game has done amazing things for LGBT res- representation, like how it yes. represents LGBT people, mm-hmm. um, which as any game from the nineties was problematic, <laughs> always kind of had it like, again, like 
City of Lies box set, I still remember as being one of the first, it, it had a canon homosexual man in it. And like, that was his, like, and it was about that of the, oh, what's his great secret? No, he's, he's just, he's just a gay man and he's a scorpion and he doesn't want anyone to know because it makes him, it amuses him endlessly that everyone thinks he has this great secret, but it's just, <laughs> I like guys. <laughs> <laughs> that's such a scorpion thing to do though to be uh-huh. like everyone thinks there's something going on um, then in 2018 they released their version of the rpg so there was the debate of whether or not this is the fifth edition of the rpg or a wholly new rpg mm. as a game designer and a game design consultant i actually argue this is very much a new new rpg set in the world because the mm-hmm. mechanics are drastically different yeah, it's a totally different. Like you play the game a totally different way. Yeah, but it, it wipes away the old canon too, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah. The old canon was iffy, though. It's like it, the, the especially fourth edition was very strong on the set your game at any time. Here are the rules. Mm-hmm. So the canonicity of any RPG is understandable. Is you know make it up yourself. Yeah. But this one is very, this one has a lot of it. Uh, it's been informed by the previous editions, and there's definitely that influence in it. But it is mm-hmm. tried to be a new beginning. Hmm. Yeah, I think that they've done really cool things with it. Fantasy Flight refers to it as the fifth edition, though, don't they? Like Again, I've heard both. Okay. It depends on who you ask. <laughs> um, but as I said, I've not gotten any consistent, like, this is fifth edition, and this, oh no, this is the new RPG. So... Fair. Yeah, I've always just, referred to it as fifth edition. They just say it's the core rule book for Legend of the Five Rings uh, on their official uh, PDF. So, so well, there you go. To answer the question of where do we start, start here. It's a good place. Yeah, yeah. It's start. Forget everything that happened before. Don't worry about it. It's messy. It's bad. There yeah. are reasons. There are reasons to remember it. There are still active communities for it, but this is a good oh, place yeah. to start. Yeah, definitely. Oh, that's great. But before we get into actual character creation, uh, there are some terms and concepts I'm sure that we're going to need to know. Yes. Um, I've only created one character for fourth edition prior. Um, so I have a very loose understanding of rings. Mm. And that's about all I remember. So <laughs> my first recommendation is forget what you remembered about rings because they're wrong. Okay. Well, I remember there was five of them. Well, that's that's still true. Okay, that, that's all do, I remember. Do keep that piece of knowledge. Yes. yes. <laughs> all right. So. All right. I tossed it out and I re-remembered that there's five rings. Okay. So um, again, uh, so in this, the concept of the five rings are the five thing, the five sort of elements that make up all of the world in a both a physical and a metaphysical sense. And so your character is a combination of these five rings, earth, air, fire, water, void, based upon the five rings of the Book of the Five Rings by Miyamoto Masashi. Um, And each of these rings are going to be rated on a value from one to five. Um, Outside of character, you're not going to start with a ring higher than three in character creation. But what these are is many, don't think of them as like your stats, these are the ways you do things. Hmm. So a character with a higher earth ring does things in an earth sort of way. What that means is careful, precise, um, stubborn, thoughtful hmm. characters that have a higher earth ring generally have a very good memory and are there to sit and will basically sort of outlast you. Hmm. Um, fire is people who are very intelligent and very vibrant and inventive and capable of just overwhelming you with sheer direct energy and force. And they will basically blast through your defenses and kick open your door and do it with a grin on their face. (laughs) Air indicates a character who is above it all. This character who is graceful, careful, deceptive, but also generally the height of control and culture. Water is adaptability and friendliness. 
Um, somebody who you never know which way they're going to come, but, and you just can't help but like them. Like part of you is like that person, hmm, that person probably is up to no good, but you know what? I just like them. I don't know why. Gosh darn it. They're so friendly. They're just so friendly. And, uh, and again, water is also generally the way of just adapting and finding a way that nobody else expects. Mm -hmm. Um, lastly, void. Void is the balance of all things. It brings all things together. And it also represents insight into yourself and into the world around you. It is also the ring of sacrifice. So if so, one of the most classic ways of striking from the void would be to literally cast aside any sense of defense, allow your opponent to strike you, and know that as they strike you, they are themselves open, and then you strike them down. Mm. So that is the path of, that is the ring of void. Now, you're some balance of all five of these. Mm -hmm. um, and how they, and really sort of how they are is going to shape how your character can, how successful your character can be at doing things that way. It's a okay. lot harder, if you're not somebody who's good at doing things in an inventive way, it's a lot harder when doing things in the inventive way is sort of the easiest way forward or mm -hmm. the right way forward. I don't have it noted on here, but I think while we're talking about rings, this is probably the best time to talk about approaches. Yes. Um, which is something that this game does beautifully and is like one of, like, it's part of why I love this game so much mm. that I think the way that approaches work in this game brings a lot to the role-playing experience that wasn't part of previous editions of the game. I love approaches. I absolutely agree with you that they are one of the best parts of this version of the game, and they are so very, very evocative. So, as a quick explanation of what an approach is, is skills are another part of your character. They are what you do. Rings are sort of how you do things. Skills are what you do. Mm. Most checks in this game are basically going to be a ring plus skill check. You basically, you have ring dice, you have skill dice, you roll them, and then you keep up to your ring and dice. Um, skill dice generally are a little bit better than ring dice. Um, there are the D12s, whereas the ring dice are the D6s. So the way the approach system works is every skill has at least five approaches, each tied to one of the rings. Um, for example, like the com when you're dealing with combat, the, the challenges of that basically are if you need to attack somebody in a way that opens yourself up, as I said, the striking is the void, that is the sacrifice approach. If you were trying to overwhelm your opponent, that's the fire approach. If you were trying to faint your opponent, that's the air approach. Uh, if you're trying to adapt to your opponent, that is the water approach. If you're trying to withstand your opponent, that is the earth approach. Hmm. Every single skill is broken into those, has those five approaches. Um, they're generally grouped along certain sort of categories of skills. Um, martial skills generally have five approaches. Social skills have five approaches. Scholar skills have five approaches. Now, the, one of the wonderful things I like about this game is just because an approach is tied to a specific category of skill doesn't mean you can't use that approach on skills that aren't in that category. Hmm. One of the examples that I'd love to use is, so the scholar approach for fire is theorize. If you were to, say, look at a piece of art, like a, a watercolor painting, and you wanted to go, how did they do that? That would be a fire aesthetics, which is artwork, skill check, because you were trying to hmm. theorize using the aesthetics skill. Interesting. Yeah, and that's just basically, so there are five approaches, there are five categories of skills, too. Five is a big number in this. Hmm. And uh, sort of finding out how you're, understanding the rings is really good for understanding how your character goes about and does all these skills. 
And one of the advantages is that because skills are sort of independent of the ring that they're going on, if you're good at, like, well, if you're good at theology, if you're good about knowledge about how religion and the gods work, then it doesn't matter what your approach is. You're rolling that many number of skill dice. But how well, how many of those you get to keep does depend mm. upon your approach. It encourages role play in a way that I think that the old system didn't. Mm. Because I just remember always being like, oh, it's perception, investigation. Mm-hmm. Investigation's mm-hmm. always tied to perception, which I think was your fire ring water Water. um but so it's like almost everything you did in that game you're like oh i'm gonna roll with water because i'm i have a really good water ring so i'm gonna pick a skill that uses water Mm -hmm. whereas this way you have to say okay i want to use this skill like say i want to use culture or government or whatever but you have to say what am i doing with that skill how am i applying it And then that determines what ring you use. So you can't necessarily always say, this is my best ring. You have to say, like, in this situation, I am trying to recall something or I'm trying to theorize or I'm trying to, Mm. you know, and like how you approach that situation is different based on what ring you're using. And then um, it encourages you to, to try and role play into your stats because I think you always want to roll with your better stats. So you're going to say... Well, if fire is my best stat, then I'm going to be like a more lively and passionate character mm-hmm. than I would be if water was my best stat, because that's not how I'm approaching any given situation. Now, the flip side to that, the approach is the what you the how hard something is to do can vary depending on the approach you take. Um, that's true too, <laughs> which I love. It's a lot. Of, if somebody is, say, for example, really grumpy. It's a lot easier to sort of get them to do what you want if you're just kind of like, look, man, I just I, I just need you to hand me that rice ball. You just hand me that rice ball, I'll be out of your hair. Rather than, hey, buddy, I, I'm kind of hungry right now. Are you hungry? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, NPCs will have stats that say, like, this is, this ring is higher so checks using that ring are harder. Mm. And like the the TN, the target number of successes that you need is going to be higher. Whereas if you go against their lower stat, like something that they are more receptive to, the check itself will be easier. So you have to get to know the characters that you're trying to work against too and realize that like this approach is going to go further just like in any regular real life social situation, certain people are more receptive to certain approaches when you go to talk to them. And I love it so much. <laughs> it's just like, it really encourages role playing in a way that I hadn't seen in a game before. And I, Oh, it's so good. It's so good. <laughs> Another mechanic that really does encourage role playing um, is the strife mechanic. So, yes. um, Whereas, sort of, if you think about dice as sort of being the engine, strife is at once the gas, but also the strain on your car. So, the, basically, strife is kind of like a social mental hit point system. The way the actual system of the game works, I gather my dice, I roll my dice, I choose which ones to keep. Why wouldn't I always just choose my best dice? I love choosing my best dice. I love being awesome. Who doesn't love being awesome? (laughs) Well, the problem is a lot of these dice have basically, in addition to opportunities, which is I do something kind of cool, successes, I succeed, I get closer to achieving what my goal is, explosive success, which is kind of like the critical. Not only do I get closer, I get to roll an extra die and add it to it, um, Paired with those three, with those two symbols that, or those three symbols that I really do want, is often an icon of strife. And what strife means is my character is getting invested. Doesn't necessarily mean that I'm getting upset. It means that my character cares more about what's going on. And the problem with that is you're not supposed to care. You're supposed to sort of be relaxed. Be sort of above it. Be in control. You're trying. You're, you're trying to be the Fonz. You're trying to be too cool for school, and you can't. It's impossible. Nobody really can. And 
So the more times, basically, the, generally the way it works is the more dice you keep, the more strife you keep. The more strife you keep, the heart, the 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 closer you get to your composure. If you ever hit or surpass your composure and strife, and by the way, there are things in this game that give you strife that aren't just rolling dice. But if you are at your composure or have exceeded it, well, now you're basically you're compromised. Is the game turn? You're showing emotion. People can really read you. It's really easy to see that you like. Your, your, your level of control over your emotions has slipped. And you know, mechanically, you can't keep dice with strife anymore. Your character is just too emotional at this point to be willing to take those risks. But once you become compromised, oh boy, that's where the fun begins. Because that mm -hmm. allows you to do the mechanic of unmasking, where your character has the dramatic reveal of their true emotions. Hmm. And it's kind of like a social limit break um, because very much worked into the system is, yeah, it might cost you people's opinion of you. It might cost you a little bit of like fame, but this is a moment of emotional truth that your character gets to go and do something. And maybe it, maybe it means they break down and cry and run away. Maybe it means they grabs that person that they truly love and embrace them in a, and kiss them in front of everyone. Maybe it means that they are like, no, table flip, you, me, outside. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the power of the unmasking is it really is up to the DM or the GM as well as the player as to sort of what, how it, the, the, the player gets to control how they unmask. And the GM gets to control the outcome. Um, and a lot of times it's it's supposed to be like, if your character unmasks, it's something that has to be very important and like will be responded to because it reminds everyone that this could be them. And like, say, for example, if your servant is standing there and just like keep it and just starts bawling in front of you. Yeah, sure. It looks bad for them, but if you don't kind of listen to what they're saying, it looks really bad for you. And that sort of, and whatever the, the obvious that they care so much hmm. that, that, that you have to sort of embrace it. And that's really where that hot blooded drama comes in. That's so, so essential to this game. And the one thing that I like, the one thing that when I finally had that first unmasking and I went, oh, oh, I just oh. ran onto a burning boat that I set on fire because that was my job <laughs> to go save people because not one more life on my watch. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, this is where that game is supposed to be. This is where I'm supposed to be playing. And it feels so good. That's it's amazing. I mean, it is an absolutely brilliant mechanic. And when I first read it, I was like, this this is everything that I have wanted. Like the drama that I've wanted from this game, that it was it was harder to find in the older editions. Mm. Like you you could make it happen, but this way the mechanics really encourage that. And I've played with people who are really um conservative with their strife and are like i'm not keeping that i'm not keeping that and i'm one of those people that's like bring it like just pile it on <laughs> yep. i want to see what happens <laughs> like i i want to be a mess yeah it's it's so good you're pretty much pedal through the metal yeah <laughs> <laughs> that's true that's how i play that's how i play uh-huh if there was ever a game that said check yes here if you want to be a hot mess it's L5R RPG by Fantasy Flight Games, and you can quote me on that. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> um, so one of the one of the sources of strife in the game, outside of dice rolling, is turmoil. Um, you will see it in the beginner's set game as turmoil. Uh, in the core rules, um, this is represented by Ninja versus Geary, which is mm. your heart's desire versus your sworn duty. Um, mm. They released a supplement called Path of Waves, which is built not for clan samurai, but for Rokugani, um, Ronin, peasants, gaijin, foreigner travelers, that sort of thing, where it's your ninja versus your past. 
And what this is, is it's supposed to be places of conflict inside your character's heart. And I think it's very important that the core rules sort of explicitly state that this is supposed to be what you want versus what society wants for you. Mm. And they should conflict because and because that is what drives you to be the hero or that's what drives you to be this larger than life figure. Mm -hmm. the, the, the source of legends, basically. Okay. Mm hmm. That I like I like when there are moments in game too where something will happen and you're just like I'm gonna take some strife for that because oh, yeah. that seems stressful. <laughs> 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 like there are times there have definitely been times where like something will happen or another character will do something and I will think that would stress my character out so much that like I'm playing in a game right now where I'm playing the courtier and I'm in this group of people who have like zero etiquette skills mm. at all and so like every time we are in a social situation they are messing everything up and i'm like i'm gonna take some strife because i can just see my eye twitching right now <laughs> like, <laughs> these people can't handle themselves <laughs> now one of the cool things about the turmoil whether it comes from ninja vs Geary or turmoil or ninja versus path are complications so complications are when the gm gives you that wonderful bit of strife in your life and you have basically the choice of either you confront it or you flee from it. Mm. Um, if you confront it, you get a void point, which is sort of your little boost of a moment of heroic action, which you can, it's, it's basically your fate point, your drama point. Mm -hmm. It's, it has a lot of different uses for it. Um, but that, that complication at the end of a scene after which you have confronted a complication, doesn't matter what your strife is, you go to zero. So you don't even have to, it's like, it doesn't, it counts as basically, it's like unmasking, it's all the benefits of unmasking without any of the negative possible consequences. You just had to, you know, your brother who you want to duel showed up and went, hi, you remember me? <laughs> and you're like, ah, oh, it's that guy again. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. All right. Well, is there anything else that we need to go over before we dive into this uh, extra narratively crunchy uh, system that uh, I am loving the sound of? Again, I think the the baseline concepts um, are all there. So now that we sort of know the feet, how the game is supposed to feel, yeah, awesome. I think that's the important part. All right. Well, sh shall we make some people? Oh, let's make some messy people. Let's make some messy people. <laughs> Let's make some people. The messiest not, of people. I am not editing that soundbite. Okay. <laughs> um, Ryan, I want to start with you. Oh, yes. Um, since you have not, since you're not in the trenches um, with this game, you're not all about it. Right. Um, we start by picking a clan. Okay, I, I like the character creation in this game. Let's start by saying... The way that it works, in the old game, you used all your stats and everything, and then there was the game of 20 questions that mm -hmm. you used to flesh out your character. In this edition, you use the 20 questions to fill out your stats. Uh -huh. So the way you answer different questions will give you different skills or oh. rings or things like that. I so, love this. Yes. So you're creating your character narratively yeah. at the same time. They even have like a, uh, they have a 20 questions guidebook on the Fantasy Flight Games website. It's a pre downloadable PDF that literally just walks you through the questions one by one. It sort of uses uh -huh. them like writing prompts for an essay. It's kind of really awesome. Now I see a note here that says um, starting values for everything. Yes. Right? So it looks like your brains all start at one. Mm hmm. Um, so all five rings get one, and then skills start at zero for each skill, which yep. makes sense. Uh, seems like we'll be determining honor, glory, and status through questions. Mm -hmm. um, endurance is calculated on the final ring value, same with composure, focus, and vigilance. So for the time being, all you need to know is your rings all start at one, your skills all start at zero. If, you, if a ring increase would ever take you to above three, instead you add one to any other ring. Oh, fancy. Okay, so 
Uh, am I assuming that I'm going to be picking first? Yeah, well, I want you to. I would love to. Um, okay, so I will 100% always pretty much choose water bonus uh, for this cr- clan thing if I can. Um, and I see there are only two clans that start off with plus one water. Uh, the Lion Clan and, thank goodness, the Unicorn Clan. Are you um, going to go with a unicorn? I am 100% going with unicorn based upon what I know of the lion from uh, the Garbage of the Five Rings podcast. <laughs> <laughs> we are not kind to the lion. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean... Look, I, have, I have hot lion takes. <laughs> I, I, I have some very, very spicy lion takes that also might verge on to, like, Avatar The Last Airbender impressions. <laughs> awesome. So, uh, as a unicorn clan, it looks like I get plus one to my water rain, mm-hmm. and I get plus one to my survival skill, and my status is set to 30, whatever that means. So, status, honor, glory status, uh, in the current RPG is mostly imported from the earlier versions. Um, it goes on a scale of zero to a hundred, zero, like, zero is bad, a hundred is good, and... Uh, most people are somewhere in between. As long as you're above 25 and below 75, you're basically just a normal person. Okay. If you get below 25 in any of these, you start taking penalties. If you get above 75 in any of these, you start getting benefits. Ooh. And in this game, honor actually like occasionally does things. Like You can stake honor on certain things. Hmm. Um, I remember when we talked about the game previously, you were like, honor seems like it's going to be really important. And I was like, you would think that, wouldn't you? <laughs> you can also stake glory and status. Yes. It's oh, just really not a good idea to stake status. No, no. that doesn't sound like... Because <laughs> it's really that's, hard to get status. That sounds like a big gamble then, right? That's basically like betting your house, literally. Oh, wow. Whereas it's a lot easier to get... Honor, honor fluctuates very quickly. Um, it will go up, it'll go down, um, depending on who you are, depending on what you do. Glory can, glory usually comes in at the end of an adventure or like at key storyline moments, or if you do something really cool in front of everyone. Okay. Yeah. Honor is like your perception of self. Glory is others perception of you. Correct. So honor is how strongly you feel about how you are fulfilling Bushido. And the higher your honor, the more you care about appearing to fulfill Bushido. Um, The lower your honor, the less you care about fulfilling Bushido. And maybe you actually do fulfill Bushido, but you just don't care to be seen fulfilling Bushido. Um, Glory is really what other people think and how good you are doing your job. Whatever that job is, it's what other people think how good you are at your job. Hmm. Um, and status is basically how how high up the ladder of social standing you're allowed to be. Um, they do, as I said, they, they do come in in certain places you can um, stake. Um, in social conflict, if you interrupt somebody with higher status, you lose glory. Um, and in combat... If all if your initiative is tied, the lowest honor goes first. Hmm. Because it's honorable to allow your opponent to go first or something like that. I Interesting. Don't know. I, I don't guess know. that kind of makes sense. No, no, no. You first. Yeah. <laughs> that's problematic, but hey. Uh-huh. Do you have any idea what you want to make? Me? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Gonna, I mean, whenever I, I... I seldom get to actually play. Um... Well, you're still not going to get to play, but you get to I make mean, a character. The beautiful at least. thing is that, like, we make <laughs> characters. Um, but I believe it was when we had Grant Howitt on, and he was like, "You don't have to get your dirty game all over it." Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I'm gonna go. I'm gonna. I, I'm gonna play a dragon. Mm. All right. I I like I like what they've done with the dragon clan in this version. Mm-hmm. And if you can't be a minor clan, might as well be a dragon. All right. I think I'm going to go with a crab. I'm shocked. Um, I'm genuinely it seems shocked. Like fun. It seems like fun. I, you know, I've, cool. I've played a crane. Normally I go with the phoenix. Um, today I'm just feeling like a crab. 
So now you know what I I did play a crab character, uh, a, a Shigenja, um, in uh, what was it? It was the the dread version of L five R. Oh yeah, of the one that Katrina ago. ran. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, fantastic. Yeah, the, Katrina loves this game, and yeah. that's I. In many ways, you can. I, I'm firmly laying a lot of everything good in this game at her feet. Mm-hmm. Um, she is the she is the mistress of the ships. Um, yes, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think. I mean. Um, one of the writers, uh, Robert Evan the Third, also known as Spooky, gives gives her gives Katrina a run for her money when he writes the Taturi Kede ship in the most current thing, where it's the mm-hmm. oh you have two people who were married and now they're finally falling in love with each other. That's nice. I'm going to be over here reading my trashy like my, my my trashy romance novel between the Crane Clan champion and the woman she can't have but loves desperately. And- <laughs> oh, it's so good. Like the Hotaru Kachiko stuff, like just oh. ugh. Oh, I'm here for it. And then you have so and then good. you have best girl and best boy going off on having adventures into the empire. <laughs> yes. And that was so totally intended. Uh, so so quick, smile divergence real quick. Um in the old lore, there are these two rather evil characters named Shahai and Daikotsu, and they had a beautiful love for each other that would literally destroy the world. I'm not joking. It actually tried to destroy the world on multiple occasions, because <laughs> that's yeah. what you do when you're evil and villainous. Totally. There is kind of a... There's Shahai and maybe Daikotsu in the current yes. thing, and they're both teenagers... And they're on the run, and they're both de- they're both depressed teenagers on the run in the Empire, and <laughs> everyone sits back and goes, <gasps> "True love." It, oh, I, mm. <laughs> so, so, but back mm. on character creation. So, right, as a dragon, it. I get plus one meditation because every dragon out there knows how to meditate, and plus one fire because dragon just kind of are in your face, mm-hmm. and That's, they breathe fire. They can literally breathe fire, but very much dragon do consider um, sincerity to be one of the greatest virtues of Bushido, which is be what you appear to be. Mm. Don't don't mess around. Don't pretend. If you say you're going to do something, do it. As a crab, I get plus one earth and plus one fitness. Um, and my my uh, tenant of Bushido. Is courage. Yeah, you, know, you can't live next to hell for every day of your life and not be brave. Also, not know how to run. Oh, yeah. I see. Okay, my turn into Bushido is compassion. That makes sense. It does. That's probably why I like the unicorn. They care. Yeah. The way of the Shinjo is the way of the open heart. And the way of the Ide is the way of the open hand, so you better pay them. <laughs> All right, so what's next? Question two. What is your family? So each great each great clan has several families. Mm-hmm. Um, the unicorn clan have the Ide, who are the merchant slash diplomats. The Ayuchi, who are the crazy wizards. Um, but they're, they're they're priests. They're priests. I'll defend that. The Moto, who are in some ways the shock troops. Okay. Also, the most diverse family, the Shinjo, who are the ruling family of, and then the Ataku, who are basically the, they keep the best horses, and their cavalry is, in in an entire clan that's built around having cavalry power, the Ataku are the most powerful cavalry. Hmm. They're also the home of the Battle Maidens, who are... Are, who are the most honorable of all of the unicorn? Mm-hmm. So you said you like water. Yes. So I think I I want I want somebody. Yeah, I see. There's two families that allow you to go up with water. Um the the Ide family or the Shinjo family. Um so the Ide family they were like the diplomats and the the merchants and stuff like that. The Shinjo are kind of like the leaders. Mm-hmm. Per se, 
And now that is that is your family. So when we get to the next question and pick your school, you can still choose to be something else. Oh. So if you pick a family that's known for being diplomats, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be. Oh, I love that. You okay. could have been trained in another school. It's also important okay. to note that when you choose your family, you get a choice of two rings. Yes. Yeah, that's right. So if I chose Ide, I would get between Earth or Water. Yep. And Shinjo is Fire or Water. Yep. So that's interesting. So I'm kind of torn between Sentiment as a skill increase and Courtesy as a skill increase. Because you also get two skills uh, yeah. based upon your family pick. And and extra glory, I guess, too, if I chose Shinjo family. They're the ruling family, so they're naturally more well-known. They have higher mm-hmm. respect. People generally think they're better at their job. Of, you know, being okay. samurai. And I already have plus one survival, so if I chose Shinjo, that would give me two mm-hmm. plus two? It would um, give you two ranks. Ass- and I'm assuming that's better. It is. Okay. More is better. Uh, more is better. That is how math works. <laughs> that's good. We're not playing golf rules here. Um, all right. Well, and... and then yeah. Finally, it also gives you your starting Koku, mm-hmm. which um, is... Eight Koku for the Shinjo family, or nine Koku for the Ide. And yeah. the best way of thinking about it is one Koku is supposed to be, beat a person for an entire year. Yeah, that's that's wild. The, the unicorn have a lot of money. <sighs> yeah, they do. They're the traders. Yeah. All right. Look uh, down on for it. I think. Gosh, they're both so good. All right, come back to me. I'll I'll get it. I'm easy. I'm going to take the Togashi order. Because All right. I like my I, I like my crazy tattooed drugs, who are secretly, you know, the reincarnation of previous tattooed monks, and <laughs> all get basically, who all receive this vision slash a dream that calls them to basically climb up into the mountains and devote their life to basically getting weird supernatural powers. Why? Because Takashi <laughs> thought at some point maybe it was important to have a large number of people who are trained to have a lot of weird supernatural powers. Mm-hmm. Now, being a Tagashi Order, I get fitness and theology, which makes sense for a bunch of monks living in a mountain. Theology being important to, you know, knowing religion and fitness being important to living in a mountain. They also get glory of 45 because they are... They are the ruling family of the of the Dragon Clan, despite the fact that they don't really leave their mountains much. But that being said, they are still widely the most well known dragon of all of the dragon. Like they're also the ones you'll see just about anywhere. You never know where you're going to see a member of the Tagashi Order. They could literally be anywhere. You do get a choice between Earth or Void. Um, Earth being the more solid, thoughtful contemplative ones void being more of the worldly ones so i'm going to choose void because i am going to be a worldly monk all right i think i'm gonna go with kuni um they are the shigenja of the crab clan known for rooting out corruption um and just being real spooky (laughs) (laughs) now the shigenja are the term used for the priests of the kami in Rokugani society, the kami being the elemental spirits that fill the world. Um, kami basically are literally the earth, the air, the fire, the water, but they're also spirits who are awake and aware and can do magic. So a shigenja is somebody who was born with the gift to basically talk directly to the kami and say, hey, can you do this for me? It turns out that if you know how to say, know how to politely ask the fire to go and burn somebody, it will do that for you. Um, while everyone can kind of do a little bit of magic, uh, that's just sort of what rituals are in this world. They're uh, we're living in literally a fantasy world. Shigenja, mm-hmm. by and far, by far and away, are the most in touch with the spiritual world. Okay. So I can pick Earth or Void. Um, I picked Void, and then I got Theology and Medicine. Mm-hmm. What family did you go with? The Cooney. Cooney. Spooky nice. Cooney. All right, Spooky. and did I say mine yet? You said Shinju or Ide, you were still deciding. I'm I'm going to go with Ide. Um, I don't want the responsibility of leadership, 
Um, <laughs> but also, uh, like the, well, what was my deciding factor? There was, I got to get back to the page. Um, so the, the Shinjo family, uh, you know, they, uh, t- 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 they pursue peace, but never flinch from the pot prospect of war. Um, whereas the Ide family work with our, to radiate calm and competence. And I think that's more in line with what, what I wanted my character to be like. The Ide, um, one of the great things from one of the novella was the line that whenever a Shinjo draws their sword, an Ide has failed their task. Mm, interesting. I have that one on my bookshelf, but I haven't read it yet. It's, it's a good one. I, I recommend it. Moto Chagatai in it is so enjoyable. <laughs> so the third question, now that we have selected each of our families, is what is your character's school and what role does that school fall in? So right. the roles uh, common to Rokugan are Bushi, Shigenja, and Courtier. Bushi are the warriors, Shigenja are the priests, courtiers are the, are the diplomats and bureaucrats. Some are also shinobi, which are basically special forces that every clan totally doesn't have. Really, they don't. It's against the law to have these special forces. That's We bring- would never. <laughs> <laughs> Looking at you, Scorpion. Scorpion totally have them, but they, have, but they don't. They, you can't make that stick. <laughs> there are also your word against mine. So mm-hmm. there are also monks who are basically um, they are people who have chosen to study the path of either Shinsei or the way of the gods, but they do not have an inherent connection, magical connection to the kami. They are just people that have studied the ways of the world in religious isolation, basically. Finally, there are artisans who are crafters and sometimes magic item makers and things like that. The way of, the path of the waves introduces actually also several more of these keywords, which is all that these basically these roles serve. Um, and every school has one. Some have two. I've never seen one yet with three, but I'm sure there are some. And it sort of gives you a taste of uh, what they are. So. Now, when you choose your school, your school comes with a two starting rings, which are just plus one to two rings, mm-hmm. um, a set of starting skills. You, depending on your school, you get between three and five of these, a starting honor value, a set of techniques that are available. And these are, as your character progresses, these are techniques. These are your list of techniques that you can learn. Um, techniques themselves are sort of cool things your character can do, and it gets broken down basically into several different categories. Um, generally, they're linked to those keywords that your that your the roles that your class serves. Mm-hmm. Then finally, you have starting techniques and your school ability, and mm-hmm. of course, your starting outfit. I totally forget about that, but that's just that's just your starting equipment. Equipment's not really important in Rokugan. Mm-hmm. You're stupidly wealthy. You have more money than most people will see in their entire life. And, oh, well, for as I said, one koku should feed a person an entire year's worth of rice. And rice is the most expensive food. So mm. you are literally wealthy beyond what other people dream of just yeah. by being born that way. Oh, interesting. There's a lot of good, uh, good, good things in here for schools. There's a lot of schools. Every family just, is given its own school. Yeah, uh, it's not really. Um, I'm looking through the the book right now, and it's it, it's kind of um, daunting because it's not really uh, it's not really organized. It feels like you want a secret. Am, that will am make I looking it even at, more daunting? Yeah, there's no rule saying you have to pick a school from your clan. Right. That's that's what makes it even more daunting. It's like, ugh, well, I, I could go with all this other stuff, couldn't I? You just need a good story. So they are still in order by clan. Yes. yes. Um, so, I mean, for somebody at the beginning, I would suggest picking one from your clan. I would, too. Um, okay. But there's yeah. always the fun, like, oh, I was a hostage, and now I... <laughs> Scorpion schools. Here's unicorn schools. Okay. That makes me feel a lot better. Okay, so they are kind of organized. Yep. 
Um, they are organized alphabetically by clan and then alphabetically by family. Awesome. So unicorn being you is the last. Yeah. And then it goes the Ide Trader School, which is a courtier school. The Yayuchi Meishoto Master School, which is a Shigenja and an artisan school. The Moto Conqueror School, which is a Bushi school. The Shinjo Outrider School, which is a Bushi and a courtier school. And then the Ataku Battle Maiden School. Mm -hmm. All right. So I wanted something that's a little magical, a little fighty. Um, and I really like the, the thought of having a horse, too. Um I think most of the unicorn have a horse. Yeah. Um and I was and I was piecing through here before I knew what the heck I was looking at. Um and I saw the Iuchi Meishodo uh master school, uh which is a Shugenja artisan school. Um looks, I think that's what you did last time. Yeah, right? I, th I think that's that's what I did when I created my last character. My, my only other character that I've ever created for anything L5R. Um, that's probably why it sticks out. Um, I'm going to pick this school, uh, from, for this character as well, I think. Yeah, I think I'm going to go with this because it looks like it's a little fighty. It's a little magical. Um, has a decent amount of honor attached to it as much as that matters. Hey, you do you. I do. I'm going to go with the Kuni Purifier school. Oh. I'm going to be a Shigenja and I'm going to have cool face paint. Oh, Yes. The Kuni who throw on their face paint before they go into battle to make themselves look even scarier when they're, you know, hurling around giant glowing green boulders and exploding people with <laughs> fire. Because, you know, you gotta, you gotta make your, you gotta, gotta wear your face makeup. Gotta look good. See, I'm tempted to do the Agasha Mystic School, because at that point, you're just, you're, you're, you're just fucking around like magic potions carrying around your six demon bag. <laughs> and but i'm i love that they have like basically magic grenades yes yeah. that's uh, amazing there's also the togashi tattooed order which is the monk school uh for the togashi order and it's sort of assumed that most togashi members are a member of the togashi order but mm -hmm. i'm actually going to go with the kitsuki investigator school mm. oh that's a good choice so one of the things about Rokugani law and order and justice is it's predicated upon the concept that people's word is their bond. Um, mm. You do what you, 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 if you are not going to say something that is true, there is a reason for that. And you are, it's for the common social good that people, if you're, if you're lying to cover your boss, that's a good thing. And the, Base upon justice is literally built upon the power of testimony. Uh, it's literally convincing the most powerful person in the room how something should go down. Mm -hmm. The Kitsuki ain't, ain't part of that. The Kitsuki <laughs> that, no, 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 no. I can figure out how it actually happened. <laughs> <laughs> and they're all about basically studying the world and figuring out how things actually were done. And then, you know, making sure justice happens as a result. Mm hmm. Kitsuki have a tendency to go either one of two ways. Either they're Sherlock Holmes or they're literally Batman, complete with a vigilante justice. <laughs> That's awesome. They're a lot of fun. So I don't I don't love the dragon, but the Kitsuki are a lot of fun. So my question is, uh so for the uh Yuchi Mishodo uh master school, I get rains plus one earth and plus one water. Mm -hmm. uh, my water is already three. So you can put that one wherever you want. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I am kind of between air and fire to put that into. Um, because that sounds the most interesting. So air is going to be grace and um deception. Mm-hmm. Also, when since you're a Shigenja, you actually have to care about what elements that you're actually dealing with. Mm -hmm. So, like, air is also the, the air kami. Yeah. So, if you want to have, like, spells that do air stuff, it could be useful. Yeah. Okay. So, I'm going to go, then, with air. Uh, so, that's a little more interesting for this character. Okay. And then I get to choose three starting skills. Um, one of them's going to be martial arts melee. That's 
literally the skill of being able to do anything that involves hitting a person with some firm form of a stick. Yeah. Yeah, I took that one too. As did I. <laughs> hitting people with sticks is always like a that, that is important in a lot of games that involve uh, hitting people with sticks. Um, <laughs> so uh, what is the difference between uh, aesthetics and design? So design is fashion. Aesthetics is painting. Ooh. Okay. Perfect. That that cements my decision then. Putting uh, one point into aesthetics. And basically, the difference between art is it between like smithing and um, aesthetics is one is making something useful like a table. The other one is okay. painting the table. Mm. Uh, and then it's is meditation like. Um, Anything aside from just meditating? <laughs> Not really. Not really? Okay. It's useful if you plan on dueling people, but that's about it. Aha. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to put one more rank in survival then as my third skill. Make things interesting. Then you have the choice of... You have a choice of techniques. And the reason that, like, Shigenja generally get less skills is because they get more techniques. Oh, okay. So... Kata are, um, they're like unarmed fighting techniques, correct? Uh, kata are all fighting techniques. Unarmed, oh, armed, right. bow and arrow, spear, everything. Anything that's basically involves fighting people, it's a kata. Um, the types of techniques are, uh, there are kata, rituals, shuji, invocations, rituals, and ninjutsu there's also maho uh in the book but there is no way to start with maho unless you get very no. lucky <laughs> we'll get to that um kata are basically your warrior techniques they are various ways of fighting people uh, there's also kiho i forgot to mention this um to mention kiho kiho are basically meditate the way you meditate and tune yourself into your own internal elements and that lets you have superpowers, like jump, flying around on, like flying around, or punching people with fire, or breathing fire, things like that. Mm. Um, shuji are social manipulation techniques uh, that basically allow you to be a better leader, or a better manipulator, or ways of sort of getting in people's heads. Rituals are. Mm. Magic that doesn't require actually talking to the magical creatures that surround the world. So things like just going, is it going to snow tomorrow? I'm going to do a little ritual and find out. Mm -hmm. um, invocations, however, are the, no, really, I'm doing magic here. Mm -hmm. And ninjutsu fall under... Basically, they're the secret techniques that that shinobi practice that, if anyone catches you doing, would actually be considered highly illegal. Hmm. Uh, then there, and then Maho is, well, evil magic that we're totally never going to use ever, are we? I, I wouldn't. No. <laughs> I don't think you would. I you have never believed you less. I never believed you. <laughs> <laughs> um, later on, Look. rules did actually also introduce a couple other types of techniques, such as patterns, which is something that artisans get access to, which is basically you get to co build cool items. Um, and again, there are just there's always design space for new types of uh, techniques, and almost every book that's been released has a collection of new techniques. Um, I'm just checking here. Yep, no, I covered every single technique type. Wonderful. So I get a couple invocations. Yes, you do. Mm -hmm. You get a choice of Grasp of Earth. You get two from Grasp of Earth, Jurgen's Balm, and the Rushing Wave. Um, you also get Rituals, which is nice. You get Communion Spirits. You also get a, a choice of Shuji. So at the end, you're going to get, like, four techniques. Nice. So I'm going to go with uh, the Rushing Wave and Jurojin's Ball. I, as a Katsuki investigator, I get Air and Earth. I also get five starting skills. So since I'm now have decided that I'm playing Togashi Batman, um, <laughs> I am taking government, so I know what the law is. 
Sentiment, so I know who the criminals are. Skullduggery, so they don't see me in the shadows. Martial arts melee, so I can hit them well. And medicine, so I know poisons? <laughs> Seems reasonable. Um, I only get two techniques, and that is a choice of one of two kata, since I am a coordinator in a bushi school. Um, I get my choice of striking as air or tactical assessment. And then I automatically get shallow waters, which basically lets me go, what are you really feeling? So I'm going to take tactical assessment because I'm Batman. May as well. And if I'm going to roll initiative while standing in the shadows up in a corner of a room, I want to be able to, like, know what people are going to do. Yeah. So I get one of two kata, either striking as earth or striking as fire. I picked striking as earth just because my earth is higher. Makes, makes sense. Um, invocations, I get Armor of Earth and the ever-favorite classic Jade Strike. Um, and then for rituals, I get Commune with Spirits and Threshold Barrier. Mm-hmm. Now, it is important to know that if you Jade Strike somebody who is not actually tainted by the horrible corrosive forces of the Shadowlands, the Earth Kami will rude. be very disappointed in you. <laughs> As such, <laughs> Jade Strike is not an acceptable method to test for people for taint. <laughs> Says someone who's not a coonie. <laughs> it's just, you know, very effective at it. Because it turns out, if they're not tainted, they have nothing to fear for being suddenly attacked by glowing green light. Yeah. <laughs> if you're not tainted, what's your problem with it? Hmm? Now. Taint no problem with that. <laughs> now, the other really cool thing that each of these schools get is their school ability which is sort of their Uh signature thing. This is, whereas anyone can get these techniques, the school ability is something that only that character can do. Only somebody who's been trained in this specific way can. For example, the Kitsuki Investigator gets Kitsuki's method, which allows them to, whenever they're performing any investigate action, so literally when they're literally doing just about anything this class is going to be doing, uh, you may treat your ranks in the skill as being equal to your school rank. Which is awesome. It means that as long as I, I'm always, I always got a little bit of investigation ability. Hmm. Nice. That's very cool. And as I get higher, that just naturally gets better. Okay. So before I get to that, uh, I had to choose one shuji um, between ancestry on Earth and Well of Desire, um, and I think I went with Well of Desire uh, just because it's water themed. Um, and it's all about giving gifts, which, uh, who doesn't like a good gift? Oh, is that the one where you like always know the right gift for the occasion? Yeah, pretty much. Like yeah. That? Yeah. That's a good one. All right. And so my school ability is the way of names as a downtime activity. I can make a TN2 design check using any rain to bind a spirit to an inanimate vessel, creating a, uh, talisman for one invocation of that element that you have learned. I have no idea what half of this stuff means, but I'll keep going. Um, While you have the talisman in your possession, reduce the TN of checks to activate that invocation by one. And you can give the talisman to another Shugenja, allowing them to perform that invocation, even if they have not learned it, and reducing the TN to activate it by one. But then it uh, uh, ceases to function after a number of uses equal to your school rank. Oh, that's really interesting. So basically, instead of having to sit there and go through the whole spell, you can do it in your downtime and bind it to this talisman, and then it is like a ready-to-use, mm-hmm. pre-prepared lunchbox of a spell. That's and that's it, delicious. And if you're using it, it's easier for you to cast the spell, or you can just hand that to somebody else who can cast who can cast spells, and even though they don't know the spell, they can cast it. Interesting. So I've got the invocation, uh, Jerogen's Balm, which looks like a healing thing or yep. poison reduction. I don't know exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, so I could turn that into a talisman. Yeah. And then later on, I could be like, all right, here you go. Here's this thing uh, in case I need it. Please. Yeah. Like you could hand it off to me and I could use it. Then. Yeah. Or, or like, uh, try to strong arm me into doing something for you in return. <laughs> no, no, never, no, never. never. <laughs> As a Tagashi monk, what? Batman. Yeah. 
So for my school skill, I get gaze into shadow. Once per round, when you make a check targeting or involving a tainted being, you may choose a number of your kept dice up to your school rank, containing a strife symbol, and set each die to a success result. So I get to add successes to things, but only when I'm dealing with tainted creatures or people, mm. which I will know after I jade strike them. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. The Cooney really like messing up people who are Shadowlands tainted. So I can't, I, I begin the game with a weapon. Yes. Um, I get a, I get a Wakazashi uh, plus one weapon, a rarity six or lower, mm-hmm. which makes me very sad because the weapon I want is rarity seven. And almost like they planned for that, but don't yeah. actually, I was going to say, don't worry later on, you might be able to get it. But like, I think that's also a rarity six weapon yeah. item down the line. What's a, what's a Yari spear. Okay, and a G? As a, a G? A G yeah. day or a G? G, J I. It was a dagger yeah. spear. Is that a dagger spear? Oh, interesting. Mm-hmm. I wanted the trident. It's pole arm. Uh, I can't have a trident, so I might as well have something cool. Yeah. There's Is there like uh, a, a hand have the rules for cool. the trident in this. Oh, the yeah, they have the trident and right there. Gear. Nice. Oh, yeah, there's all descriptions of everything. Well, that makes more sense. Yeah. Oh well, so, and it's one it's one Koku out of my uh, reach as well. <laughs> I could spend nine years worth of food to yep. buy one try. <laughs> That's ridiculous. Yeah, gives a scale of economy, doesn't it? Uh huh. I mean, and the, the the reason for that is basically like uh, it takes years to train somebody to be able to make one of those, and. You can literally, as a noble, just command somebody to spend your entire life just making as many of those as I have resources for. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, the the amount of money that, like, the, again, it's just part of this, like, it's which is why one of the one of the wonderful things about the blend of this game versus the Path of Waves version of this game is you go from this thing where you're literally the top at the top of this social structure to like, so today I had to go beat up some thugs in a bar to go just get a bowl of porridge because that was my pay (laughs) i could sell my swords but i wouldn't find anyone who'd be able to actually pay me enough to be what they're worth but it beats starving to death Mm -hmm. which is one of the again uh, one of the style of cinema i've always loved that l5r is heavily informed by um, the uh, the basically the the period pieces from Japanese cinema and the samurai films basically the, the Chanbara mm-hmm. films is what they're called sword fighting literally. Mm-hmm. All right, uh, I'm just. Are we ready for question four? Not yet. I'm picking my second weapon. I'm gonna pick a G, uh, the right. dagger spear. Um, just because why not have a pole iron while you're on a horse? It's a good thing yeah. to have. My only yeah. choice in my starting equipment is whether or not I want a staff or a jian, which is a straight blade rather than the traditional uh, Rokugani katana. The jian is a, basically a Chinese broadsword. So oh. I, I, I love the fact that they have those. I love the fact that they have started including not just, not just traditional Japanese medieval weaponry in this game, but have expanded mm-hmm. it to basically cover other weapons that were used in Japan. <laughs> yes. I don't and get any choices of weapons. I get a wakazashi and a knife. You also have magic spells to destroy things. Well, Ryan has magic spells too, but he gets... <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to complain. I do get a makeup kit, so... Yeah. Okay. Traveling clothes, ceremonial clothes, calligraphy set, traveling pack, and a unicorn war horse. I, I have a I have a journal of observations, also known as a hit list. Nice. Or a manifesto. Okay, and then um, I just had one last question about this school stuff. Is it has a group of ranks? It has advances and types. We will cover that in our leveling up. Oh, section. cool. Okay, so you can just leave that. So there's just a bunch of information to all those following line at home. Uh, that's just kind of in your face right there. And uh, we'll figure that out later. It's called your curriculum. Uh huh. <laughs> and it's one of the most confusing parts of this game. <laughs> it is. Uh, but more importantly, we forgot to mention 
your school gives you your honor. Oh, oh yeah. yes. My honor is 45. Mine's a whopping 35. Oh, I start with 40. So I, I'm right in the middle. Yep. Most people are between 30 and 40. That makes um, sense. A particularly honorable character, such as the Kitsuki Justicar is a 45. The lion get up to like 55. <laughs> well, like, they're literally obsessed with it. So, yeah. All right. All right. Question four out of 20, Ryan. <laughs> After this, it gets it faster. Along. It gets a lot faster. It does. I hope so. I hope so. I mean, there's choices to make, but. um. Yeah, it's, it seems like those first three were the meatiest. Yep. Yeah, those are the ones that are going to define the most about your, about like mechanically. All right. How you play. I'm ready for this. Thank you for joining us for part one of this character creation series. We'll be back in part two, picking up right where we left off. Character Creation Cast is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts, this show, and even our press kit. Character Creation Cast can also be found on Twitter at CreationCast or on our Discord server at discord.charactercreationcast.com. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan Bolter, and I can be found on Twitter at Lord Neptune or online at lordneptune.com. Our other host, Amelia Antrim, can be found on Twitter at Ginger Reckoning. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license or with permission from the podcast they originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. Our main theme music is Hero Remix by Steve Combs and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by Ryan Bolter. Further information for the game systems used and today's guests can be found in the show notes. If you'd like to leave us a rating or review, we have links to various review platforms out there, including Apple Podcasts, in our show notes. Also, check the show notes for links to our other projects. Thanks for joining us. And remember, we find that the best part of any role-playing game is character creation. So go out there and create some amazing people. We will see you next time. Now we gotta read some show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Character Creation Cast is hosted by the One Shot Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, visit OneShotPodcast.com, where you will find other great shows like Warda. Warda is an original fantasy actual play podcast created by Ali Grauer and Drew Marzieski. It's one part Game of Thrones, two parts Downton Abbey, served on the rocks with a twist of Agatha Christie. Discover magic, mystery, and more than a little sociopolitical commentary along the way. The city holds thousands of stories. What will yours be?